Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Gary Latshaw. I'm on the Cupertino Sustainability Commission. And it's my pleasure this evening to introduce to you Dr. Rosalind Grimes. She is the director at NASA Ames Partnership Office and leads NASA partnership participation in planetary sustainability partnerships. I assume that planetary is Earth, not? So far. So far, okay. Rose received her doctorate in cancer biology from Stanford University and began her career in NASA as a research scientist. She was executive director of the NASA Astrobiology Institute during its formation and from 2000 to 2008, founding director of the Advanced Studies Laboratories, a partnership between NASA and the University of California. NASA recognized her entrepreneurial accomplishments with medals for outstanding leadership and exceptional service. In 2016, she was recognized among federal employees with the Pres Presidential Sustainability Hero Award. I wonder if they're still giving that out. They right? are not. <laughs> The last time this award was, oh, what did I say? The last time this award was presented. So they're saving money by not giving that award out anymore. Let me introduce you, uh, Dr. Rosalind uh, Grimes. Thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to come and speak with you as a Cupertino resident. I know that Cupertino is interested in development and in the consequences of development and that Cupertino has um, uh, desires, concerns, challenges in um, public buildings uh, as well as commercial and residential buildings. Uh, as a homeowner, I assume that many of you are interested in changes that you might make in your own construction or in the way that you utilize energy and of course the city is interested in thinking about all those issues in its in its own buildings and facilities so uh, what I have brought to talk with you uh, about tonight is specifically a facility called sustainability base which was constructed at NASA Ames from 2009 to I think uh, about 2009 to 2011, it took a little bit over a year uh, to complete construction and move in. And uh, I'll be telling you about the facility and about some of the choices that we made at the time in terms of uh, design. We wanted it to be very forward-leaning design. It was this, the first facility that we had constructed at NASA Ames in uh, over 20 years uh, at, at that time. And also our desire to incorporate NASA technologies uh, into the building where, wherever it made sense, wherever possible. And we also planned for this facility to be a living laboratory so that we would continue to try out new technologies in the building and be an honest broker for reporting what, what worked and what didn't work. And so I'm, I'm also very happy to share all of that with you uh, transparently today, but not knowing specifically what each one of you is gonna be interested in, uh, I'll first give you a, a general introduction to the facility and some of, its, uh, some of its building systems. And then I think probably in exchange, a, a Q&A where I can go more deeply into some of those choices that you might be more interested in is, is something I can undertake. So first of all, I want to introduce you to uh, NASA in Silicon Valley. Uh, people are generally interested in NASA. Not everybody in the Bay Area uh, recognizes that you have uh, a NASA facility. So the National Aeronautics and Space Administration has its headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have 10 field centers across the United States, and the field centers at, uh, for example, Kennedy Space Center and Johnson Space Center are nationally uh, more well-known than Ames Research Center. But Ames is one of the older NASA facilities. Uh, it was established, I believe, this year or next year is its 80th year. So approximately, let's say, 79, 80 years ago. Uh, but it was originally an aeronautics facility. Uh, NASA Ames here on the West Coast and NASA Langley in Langley, Virginia, uh, were the two aeronautics centers that were established uh, before the Second World War. But when um, aircraft were increasingly recognized as um, an instrument uh, of um, surveillance and could be an instrument of force and could be an instrument of war. And the United States wanted to ensure that it was at the forefront of that technology, both for commercial and um, 
civil uses, but also for, for military uses. And then in 1958, when the National Aeronautics and Space Administration was formed by an act of Congress, Ames and Langley were incorporated into that organization, and that's how we became aeronautics and space exploration. So it's a civilian agency charged with both aeronautics research as well as exploring space. And that um, charter to explore space extends to the near-Earth space uh, around our planet. And so that leads to NASA's uh, focal missions in Earth sciences Earth sciences, and what for some period of time we were calling mission to planet Earth. I'm not sure if they're using that term anymore, but it, it's a good one. So it explains our interest in understanding uh, our planet and the evolution of processes on, on our planet. So that's just a little bit about NASA. About our facility, some of these um, slides are kind of general, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the, the process that we undertook in choosing how to go about this. Uh, NASA's a little bit unusual in comparison to other federal agencies. Most of the U.S. government federal agencies acquire their, uh, their, their locations, whether they're courthouses or office buildings or warehouses or whatever, through the GSA, the General Services Administration. So the GSA undertakes to develop the contracts for construction, for design, or they find buildings and then they arrange to rent spaces in them for federal entities. NASA is one of the few. I don't know if it's the only. It's the only one I've ever come across, but I may just have not been exposed to it. But NASA has the authority from Congress to manage its own facilities. And a lot of that is due to the fact that NASA does really unusual things. We launch rockets. We test rockets. And so many of the NASA locations are um, in relatively un unpopulated areas uh, to keep some of those hazards away from the population. But at the same time, being in an uninhabited area, uninhabited by people, doesn't mean that you're in um, an area devoid of um, flora and fauna. So in fact, there's quite a bit of expertise in the agency in managing environmental hazards to make sure that areas uh, like the, um, like the um, pristine areas around Kennedy Space Center, uh, where there are manatees and you know, many different species of birds and uh, swamp conditions and, and maintaining those in the face of the kind of hazards that are potentially um, put, put, put into the environment as a result of NASA operations is a very strong focus within the agency. And the same thing is true at Stennis Space Center, uh, which is uh, just north of New Orleans, uh, where there's also a very large wooded area with um, Bargeways and canals, so that they can bring in heavy equipment. But NASA is very, uh, very, very cautious of. But we also have a tremendous amount of oversight uh, from agencies that are concerned with the quality of the environment and how we impact it. So we manage our own facilities, uh, but we also manage our facilities within federal budgets. So um, many of the of the buildings at Ames and at many other field centers are, are well beyond their predicted useful lives. They're more than 30, 40 years old. And so this is definitely a challenge for the agency to uh, manage older buildings and undertake the work necessary to replace them with, with newer facilities. So sustainability base uh, was uh, part of a competition within the agency. There were some funds available to do construction, or we call them um, C of F, Construction of Facilities Funds, because, of course, we do everything by acronym. You'll have to raise your hand or wave at me if I use an acronym that you don't know. So we were going to compete for these funds, and it was called a um, renovation by replacement exercise. So we would propose to headquarters what we're going to tear down that's old, expensive, wasteful, chews up a lot of energy, and instead what we were going to replace that with. And our proposal to headquarters was one of the proposals that was accepted, and so we were awarded the, the funds to do that construction. And I've actually forgotten the, the exact number, but it was on the order of 25 or 27 million. It was, in there, it was under 30 and it was over 25. Uh, and the first design that was done for this facility uh, was presented to our senior management at Ames. And it looked uh, very much like a number of other f uh, buildings at Ames. And so you know it had that consistency of, of design look. But the reason it looked consistent was that the last building we had put up was 20 years ago. So it looked like a 1980s building. 
And uh, one of our senior managers, Steve Zornitzer, who is um, the assistant director for research and technology, who coincidentally re retired, um, I think, a couple of weeks ago, but his celebration was today. I'm looking at Bob Cormier in the audience, because actually I know a number of you from my, um, from my participation on some of the, uh, my and my husband's participation on the Cupertino commissions. Um, but also Bob's very familiar with this building and often does tours of it um, for it, so he knows Steve really well. So Steve Zornitzer looked at those plans and said, you're not serious. With the first chunk of money that we've had, and this is such an unusual opportunity, and you're actually proposing to design something you could have built 20 years ago, that's just not good enough. And Steve's colleagues generally said, uh, well, that's great, Steve, but you know, over to you. Uh, we're not going back to the drawing board on this. Uh, and soon thereafter, Steve ran into William McDonough, coincidentally at a meeting at Johnson. And honestly, I can't tell you why Bill was there or what the, um, what the meeting was about, but they got to talking. And uh, McDonough was willing to be a consulting uh, design architect on a, on a new approach to the project. So the result of what we have today is part of uh, McDonough's philosophy of uh, native to place design. Uh, the architects of record were AECOM and the builders were Swinerton. So um, using McDonough's design principles, this very different kind of structure was envisioned that would incorporate sustainability principles that would um, use um, materials that were to the most, for the most part um, generated from uh, the local environment. So there wasn't a lot of shipping back and forth. Uh, the construction site was um, professionally managed, so the um, hazards that were generated from demolitions and constructions were minimized. The building was designed to allow uh, natural lighting, uh, uh, to use energy carefully, to generate energy on site, to recycle water and reuse water. So there were a number of things that arose out of Bill McDonough's involvement in the project. Uh, for all of these purposes. And you see now a few pictures of the facility to kind of get some familiarity. It's a 50,000 square foot um, building. It's, it's, it's offices. It's in two semicircular uh, wings, one in front of the other, two half moons, and it's just two stories. So it's a relatively small facility. McDonough's philosophy is native to place. And one of the reasons why this resonated with NASA is um, in NASA's um, uh, lingo, in our dictionary, native to place, using the materials that are available locally, uh, we call in situ resource utilization, ISRU. Uh, and that's an acronym that we use a lot. So the Latin in situ, in place, resource utilization, is um, built into plans for exploring the moon and Mars. It's, it's, um, it recognizes from NASA's perspective that when we're involved in space exploration and in envisioning uh, workable facilities and habitats for humans distant from the Earth, every pound that's launched is extremely expensive and water is particularly heavy. And so we're always of the mindset in our technology development and in designing our plans for space exploration, for planetary exploration, for human exploration, to do in situ resource utilization to the greatest extent possible to use materials that are at the locations we wish to go to and live in and work in and explore and particularly recycle. We want to recycle water so that we don't have to launch it all from Earth, but we can either recover it in, on site in situ, or that we can reuse it from the, first, um, from, from the first amounts that we bring along with us. And of course, we're always interested in energy generation and particularly in using solar energy. So many of the elements of sustainable design and sustainable operations are just fundamental to the way NASA thinks about its mission, its technology development, uh, and its goals. So here you see some of the features of the facility and its design and how it uh, accomplishes its goals. In terms of daylighting, it has very tall banks of windows. Some of the initial modeling showed that we wouldn't need to use the artificial lights, the overhead lights in the building, more than, I think it was 30 days a year. Now, of course, human beings have the behavior of walking into a space and flipping a switch. It's just a natural thing that we're accomplishing. Uh, accustomed to doing. And that certainly happens in the building, no question. Uh, but it's not necessary in order to function, even to function uh, well. And if you can get people into a different habit 
uh, they will often find that uh, they haven't turned the lights on and they haven't been uncomfortable in their work environment until, say, on a winter's day, maybe three or four in the afternoon. And then you'll begin to notice it's a little dim and somebody will turn on a light. So it's a, there's a lot of um, human, human behavior, a lot of occupant interaction that's essential to making these kinds of facilities operate according to the design principles. In some of the meetings that I've been to, the, um, the measurements post-construction during occupation or surveys of the occupants indicate that most of the buildings that are designed with these kinds of sustainable principles that I'm talking about actually operate uh, well below uh, their predicted de design parameters. And the reason for that is mostly how the occupants interact with the building. Uh, many times there are offices which have uh, floor-to-ceiling glass walls and people decide for a variety of reasons, many of which uh, they deserve to be acknowledged for, they might design to paper them over. They're not really trying to defeat your sustainability goals, but they find in their kind of work that they require a level of privacy or prefer a level of privacy and the floor-to-ceiling glass walls don't do it for them. So it's a very important consideration, both when you're designing a facility to address the needs of the occupants and when you're planning to move in people to a facility that they understand how the building is designed to operate and, and kind of concur with um, going along with those plans. We also have automated windows. So the top bank of windows on both the first and the second floor are automated. They're controlled by a computer. And for example, the computer might be set based on external thermo thermo thermometer readings that when the external temperature is 80 degrees, you automatically open the windows because you can allow fresh air to come in from the outside and equilibrate with the inside temperature. Uh, and you can choose that setting to be you know, whatever you and the occupants agree on. You know, it could be 76, 78, whatever. Uh, and we did that for a while. Um, so interesting. Interesting fact, and this is sort of an illustration of some of the things that I have to, to tell you that we can go into more deeply for those who are interested. Uh, when the windows were first installed, they had uh, gears on either side of a, of a long window. You can sort of see in the image that these are rectangular windows. They're not huge. I'd say they're maybe uh, one foot by two feet, roughly, something like that. And they had um, activation arms on, on either end. And when the window opened, a screw would turn, and that would push an armature, and that would open the window. And even during construction, we recognized that in all of these windows, and there are hundreds of them throughout the building, if the screws at either end become a little bit offset, then the whole window begins to torque, and that begins to strip the screw and the metal on the screw, and then the torquing is just going to get worse and worse. So you would have thought that the manufacturer would have figured that out in their own laboratory when they designed these windows to sell them and did some you know, internal testing. I can't comment on that, only that we discovered it as we were in the process of, of construction. So they went back and retrofitted all the windows with a single larger armature that could manage the weight of the whole thing, uh, but it didn't have the problem of, that you inherently had if you had two screws. So that was a solution. But when we completed construction and people began to live in the building, and this was around November, I think of, I want to say 2010, I moved into the building November or December of that year, and we actually had an opening ceremony in April. So as time went on through March, April, May, and the temperatures got warmer, and we began to use this program and have the windows open automatically, the first time they, the first time I can recall they, they opened all over the building on a basis of this temperature setting, it sounded like a 7047 was landing on the roof. <laughs> it was so loud. It was frightening. And it was a sound that I had never heard before. So you, you do sort of get used to it over time, but it's never a pleasant experience. And it happens sometime in the afternoon on a summer's day, but never at the same time every day. So after about a year's worth of interaction with that, uh, we, we shut down the system. The amount, I mean, it uses a little bit of energy to open the windows, right? So you are spending some energy. And the amount of energy that we're being saved as a result of using that particular uh, design option was just not worth the, the downside of the you know, negative reports and the disruption. So uh, ver relatively few buildings have this kind of, um, have this kind of feature. Uh, we were approached by the University of Colorado at one point 
who's, um, it was probably the architecture department, it might have been design and sustainability or something, they were doing some uh, international studies. And this kind of building with both um, uh, automated windows and manually operated windows, because the lower bank of all these windows is manually operated. Uh, it's called a mixed mode building. And they were seeking locations like ours to do some testing in mixed mode buildings. So I gather that it's not all that common. But a couple of years after sustainability base was completed, I did read about a, a lead platinum building. It's about the same size as sustainability base, but instead of being um, on a large footprint like ours, it's very, very tall. It's in an awkward space. I think it's in Seattle. And they have windows like this. And I, you know, I wondered when they put those in, what their experience of the sound when they open and close them is. There are also some in, um, in um, uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, the NREL labs in uh, Golden, Colorado. And we went out there and looked at their facility, which predated ours when we were thinking about ours. I can't tell you why the, the issue with the windows didn't come up. I do know that after we, we discovered our noise issue, that we certainly contacted them and said, our windows are just hard. What did you do with yours? And apparently they um, retrofitted all of their windows with um, a wrap. That, it's a noise baffling wrap that they put around the armatures on all the windows. But we didn't have the money to do that, so we just turned our system off. But anyway, so in multiple places it's been problematic. It's not something I would recommend. So um, that's kind of an example of one of the principles. We have um, photovoltaic uh, panels. Um, this didn't actually fit within our design cost. Uh, the amount of money that we got from headquarters, uh, the, but, it, but the state of California participates in, um, in a power, power purchase plans. Uh, and there is a special aspect of that for, the, for federal government facilities. So we um, embarked on that, where PG&E comes to your facility and it set, tells you what you could do in order to save energy and water. And in our case, they looked at the whole campus, not just this building. But they looked at the whole campus, uh, and there were a lot of things we could do, replacing uh, toilet fixtures and faucets and things like that, uh, and including installing solar panels on sustainability base, which, which we wanted to do anyway. So by uh, partnering with PG&E, we were able to take advantage of a, a program whereby PG&E purchases the, uh, the panels. And uh, you continue to, uh, um, NASA Ames continues to pay a standard amount of its energy bills, but over the next five years after those improvements are made, gradually what your, your monthly payments are doing are paying down the capital cost of these items. And so eventually you own them, uh, and it's a way of getting past the original capital purchase price. And so that was an interesting option for us. We also have, and I don't have a slide on this, but we also have a Bloom box, a Bloom Energy Solid Oxide Fuel Cell, uh, which is also on site, but also was not part of the uh, construction cost funds that we got from NASA headquarters. Uh, that uh, generates CO2, uh, so it's um, not greenhouse gas neutral. It uses natural gas, and it does produce CO2. Some of the advantages of the solid oxide fuel cell are that it has a higher efficiency in generating, generating electricity as a result of um, the chemical combustion of the natural gas in the solid oxide fuel cells, and you're generating that power on site. So you don't lose uh, the quantity of electricity, of energy, that um, would just be lost in, in the transmission lines by importing the electricity from another location. So there are advantages to the solid oxide fuel cell. And this is an example, the Bloom Energy Box, of um, one of the areas in which we incorporated NASA technology. I kind of described how we incorporated some of NASA's mindset with the in situ resource utilization with this native to place design concept. Uh, but in addition, in terms of technology, the, the solid oxide fuel cell technology, which is patent, which is the basis of Bloom Energy's business model, uh, was one of the founders of that, one of the developers, was uh, Dr. Sridhar, uh, initials KR. So KR Sridhar was a NASA Ames employee and developed the solid oxide fuel technology as part of the work that he was doing to consider energy generation for um, uh, habitats and workspaces for Martian exploration, for example. And so he recognized that the technology had other applications. And at the time, there were some 
interruptions of funding to the project that he was working on that had to do with Mars exploration. And so he left NASA and was one of the founders of Bloom Energy. For in the early years, Bloom Energy had its offices in the NASA Research Park, which is an area that um, NASA Ames inherited when the um, Moffett Federal Airfield was turned over to us following the Navy, uh, Moffett Naval Air Station closure, late 70s, early, no, it was later than that. It was probably, it might've been the 90s that then the Navy left Moffett Field. Uh, so then some of the spaces external to the Ames Research Center that are now under our management, we have a NASA research park and Bloom Energy had offices there. So we have a partnership with Bloom Energy and part of the contract when we installed uh, the solid oxide fuel cell, uh, they had already been in business, they'd already been selling solid oxide fuel cells, call it um, generation one or fuel cell 1.0. The one that we have at sustainability base is the very first model of Generation 2.0. So there was some genu genuine novelty. Uh, and Generation 2.0 was rated to uh, produce more energy uh, than the, the first boxes. And we were in a partnership, we still are, with Bloom Energy to monitor its operation. So one of the things that we've noticed in um, the 2.0 Bloom Energy fuel cells is that they, they decrement, they lose efficiency pretty rapidly. You, you can notice it over a period of months. I believe that it's supposed to make uh, 200 uh, kV 24-7, but we notice in, in uh, the readouts from the um, machine, I don't recall that I've ever seen it making 200. I've seen it making maybe like 195, and then it quickly goes down to 185, 180. But we're in a contract with Bloom Energy, and they come out and maintain it. And um, what, what they would pay us, what they would pay us in return for the amount of energy it doesn't produce we then kind of bundle and turn around and pay them back in the maintenance. So we're essentially have been getting the maintenance free. It turns out to be a pretty good relationship. You had a question? Blue Energy stations is natural gas. So does it generate and therefore consume the natural gas based on the energy demand of the building? No, um, it generates constantly and produces electricity constantly. Uh, and we don't power the building directly off the fuel cell nor off the solar panels. The solar panels do have a direct connection into the building because it was new construction and we could do that. But um, NASA headquarters preferred that uh, all that energy generation be tied into the Ames grid. Uh, so rather than uh, create a bullet point f you know, for a sales pamphlet that says that we, we only do this in one location, that we're powering the whole building off of these things, it's, um, it's a mission risk. If any of these, if any of these um, fuel cells or solar panels or something fail, then that building would be without energy. And there just wasn't any reason to do that. You know, we're, we're not isolated. We're not in some rural area. We could easily attach everything to the grid. So the, the facility is grid. Well, thank you. Oh. Oh, the facility is grid tied to PG&E, right? So you're, you're generating and, run, and running your meters backwards, selling it back to PG&E? No. no? Um, because we're, we're a federal facility in federal land, um, PG, as I understand it, and I may have some of these details wrong, but PG&E is the local provider. You know, they, they run all the lines. We actually buy our power from the Western Area Power Authority, WAPA. So we pay a negotiated federal rate, and WAPA power is almost exclusively hydroelectric power. But PG&E is the delivery mechanism because they own all of the, the lines in that area. Uh, so we're, we're not selling power back to pg and &E, and we are, in fact, using it all on site and, and bringing in more. But on paper, you know, you can't say where the electron came from. But on paper, we're buying our power consumption from WAPA. Thank you. And the solar panel uh, strings that were on the previous slide, um, are they um, one inverter for many panels, or do you have micro-inverters, one per, for each panel? Uh, there's not one for each panel, but I recall there being more than one inverter. So I think the, they come together. I, I'm, when I last remember being up there, I think there were two. Do you remember, Bob? Are there two inverters or is there one? At least two. There's at least two, yeah. I think there's not dozens, but there are at least two. I think that's how they yeah, come together. Yeah. Uh, that you. might be why there are two, yeah, because there are two wings to two buildings. And we also looked at, um, in case anybody is interested, we looked at uh, the benefits of cleaning the solar panels. Uh, we looked also at an academic research study with Carnegie Mellon University that wanted to look at some automated uh, washer arms 
on the solar panels to see what's the cost benefit analysis between the technology that you would have to install to periodically clean your solar panels to maintain them at peak efficiency um, versus just letting them lose efficiency and measure how much of a loss there is. So if anybody's thinking about the, the balance between getting your, your solar panels washed versus just leaving them dirty, we have some insights on that too. No, we haven't had them watch. We, we looked at some uh, published um, technical papers, and it turns out that although the panels get dirty and they do get old and they, they lose some efficiency, the amount that they lose and the amount of, of dollars that you can assign to that, particularly, sorry, particularly in our case, buying our power from WAPA, uh, it was very inexpensive. And so this is where you get into the, um, the difference between choices that you make because they are optimal forward-leaning designs versus choices that you make because they're economical. So in, in our case, washing the solar panels or installing complicated but beautiful robotic ways of cleaning the solar panels wasn't worth it. So certainly the, power, the panels today make less energy than they made when they were first installed, but it's not worth doing much about it. And most of the published papers that I found when we were first researching this back in 2012 show that the uh, panels get sufficiently cleaned by rainfall. So you know, once a year, you get a little bit of natural cleaning, d depending on how much rainfall you get. And all in all, as an economic proposition, it's pretty good. Uh, so we also have um, some water recycling in the facility. And this is also a NASA system. Uh, at the time, 2009-10, uh, when we were getting permits, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, allowed uh, locally. And I, possibly anywhere in California. It might have been allowed in LA, I'm not sure. But it, it wasn't typical to do water recycling on site. But this is another technology, as I mentioned, for space exploration and supporting humans in space that NASA Ames specifically works on water recycling. Uh, on the space station, the system that is used to recycle water so that the astronauts uh, have a fully enclosed loop and the coffee that they drink today and the urine that they express as a result is the coffee that they drink tomorrow. So that's a system that was designed at NASA Ames. Uh, and we wanted to incorporate that system into our facility. So in order to do that, we dual plumbed the building. So there are two separate plumbing systems that allow us to harvest the water from uh, showers and sinks, not from toilets. We're not doing black water, which is how we term uh, water that's been contaminated with human waste, but gray water. So water with little soap suds from, from washing hands and from showers. So that's treated separately at sustainability base through a system that um, is derived from our design principle that's used on space station and that has been used um, in, in a number of other locations. And again, that's something that I can tell you more about if anybody's interested, but, but for now, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, the, the landscaping is designed to use um, as little water as possible. We also, uh, the federal land that we are stewards of sits on top of a uh, Superfund plume. Most of that is a result of the uh, semiconductor industry uh, in the valley that's moving towards the bay. So it's moving under our land, but it didn't originate on our land. Some of it's a result of the um, degreasing activities on the airfield that the Navy was responsible for before they moved out. But now that we're the federal landlords, we're responsible for remediating that. So there is a location uh, in, uh, I think it's in Sunnyvale. It's at the conjunction of uh, Moffat, Ellis, and Wisman streets, where there is a pumping facility where this Superfund plume water is pumped out of the groundwater and run through activated carbon. And um, back uh, about, 10 years ago or a little bit longer, before sustainability base, we, uh, we are overseen by, I'm um, sure, some California agencies and also by the EPA in terms of how we're treating that water. And after it was pumped out of the ground and cleaned, we paid a permitting fee to discharge that clean water into the San Francisco Bay. Because actually, even though it's clean, you don't want to be putting fresh water in the bay. It's a saline environment. So when we constructed sustainability base, we used that opportunity to run a dedicated line from that uh, water treatment facility 
to our campus so that we can use it for landscaping and it's used for landscaping at sustainability base because that clean fresh water is not potable but it is a better solution than discharging it into the bay and it's a better solution than using potable water for our landscaping needs so that's another way that we decided to save water when we when we undertook the construction and we have emphasized the reuse of materials inside. I, I mentioned that we got the money for this construction by a renovation by replacement competition. So um, in, the, in the upper image, you see that our lobby areas are reusing the um, one inch tongue and groove white oak flooring that was salvaged from the demolition of a, an underutilized and you know, um, out of date 14 foot wind tunnel uh, facility, which is what was torn down. As, as part of our renovation by replacement. And it's really beautiful. And we're very proud of reusing that. The internal furnishings are designed to allow daylight to penetrate. Um, we did a special uh, procurement, uh, putting out our requirements for the furnishings inside the building. Uh, we have um, sit-stand desks because we wanted to have standard furnishings throughout. But of course, people come in different shapes and sizes and have different preferences for how they work. So these desks. Um, will uh, will accommodate you sitting they'll accommodate you standing or anywhere in between uh, they're electric they're electrically operated and they're also ergonomic chairs uh, some of which are make use of recycled materials and others are recyclable because they um, I remember somebody demonstrating this to me once with a, with simple household tools they come apart into piles of textiles plastics metals and so it facilitates you recycling those at end of life. Now, some of the things that we've done with the building as a living laboratory, uh, and these I'll try to go quickly through because there's a lot of um, comp complicated technology here which you may or may not be interested in. Some of the research that we do at NASA Ames is in um, advanced computing, in technology development, systems health management, uh, software controls, autonomy, data mining. Uh, so one of our approaches to the building is to use its facilities to advance our own software that could be used on, uh, on aircraft, on um, space exploring vehicles, and habitats on other planets for doing systems health management. The, the building has, gosh, I haven't done this for a while, but I think it's about 2,000 sensor points, something like that. Uh, those sensor points, um, some of which are actually individual locations that gather a temperature reading or a CO2 reading or a humidity reading. And some of them are places where those readings come together and are um, collected. And that too is a point. So about a half of the 2,000 points, about a 1,000 of the points are actual locations in the building where some physical piece of information is being gathered. And about a 1,000 of the points are some other place where those information points are being combined. And, and fed into a computer. Uh, the, the anticipation of all of that information completely changed our approach to facilities engineering on campus. Our facilities engineers had to upgrade and update their central location because most of our buildings might have 50 sensor points if they had any, but sustainability base was going to have thousands. So we had to consider how we were going to deal with that influx of information. It was also the time when, although we had um, T1 Ethernet, you know, large um, data exchange um, Ethernet lines uh, coming to Ames and available to Ames, our buildings were not typically utilizing those. They were communicating with our facilities engineers over phone lines. And so that was, a, that was also an opportunity to you know, uproot the phone line kind of system and make sure that there was T1 coming to all of our buildings. So there were a lot of changes to the campus that happened as a result of sustainability base. So some of our researchers are, are using the information that's derived from, from the building uh, to work through their own research. Same thing with data mining. We're looking at the information coming from the building to mine the data to teach computer algorithms how to find anomalies from what the building is reporting uh, in, the, in the combination of, uh, of all the sensors that are, that are reading out real-time information. Uh, the gray water recycling system is also an opportunity for data mining. Uh, so it also has uh, many points of its process that are, that are monitored. Um, 
uh, and I can tell you more about this if you like. It's also been used in research work with the, uh, with the Army. In fact, it was offline from the building immediately after construction was complete because the Army was so interested in it that they wanted us to do a research project for them. But in order to dedicate the space to them, we had to disconnect it from the building. So that took a little while. But um, you know, we're a, we're a national team player. Our goal for the building in, in, in the future, our um, kind of predictive uh, forward-looking goal is to use the, uh, the data mining, use the systems health management to do intelligent integrated control. And there are a number of companies like um, large, large um, building management companies, Siemens is, is uh, certainly one of them, that are also doing research uh, along these lines and a number of them have come and, and sought to partner with us. So how do we partner? Uh, I mentioned the, the National Aeronautics and Space Act of 1958 and it has this language in it that gives NASA this unusual authority. In addition to the authority to manage our own locations, now Congress gave us the authority to not only do procurements, to do you know, large-scale buys of the products and services that we need, or to do grants, which is where we uh, seek academic and nonprofit partners who want to do basic research. In addition to procurements and grants, we have this other transactional authority, which of course we call OTA. So the other transactional authority allows us to enter into agreements, uh, cooperative agreements or others that um, can be with any, as it says, person, firm, association, corporation. It can be international or national. It can be academic. It can be nonprofit. It can be commercial. So this is a very broad opportunity that NASA has almost uniquely in the federal government to enter into cooperative partnerships. Uh, and we call these Space Act agreements because they're in a, an agreement, and it's a legal instrument, but they are um, uh, they're, uh, open to us because of the Space Act, and so that's why we call them Space Act agreements. So we have Space Act agreements with a number of emerging companies. Uh, one of them is Vertigris Technologies. It's a local small business, and they have installed some of their uh, controllers in sustainability base. They're deriving data from a real facility, which helps them improve their product and learn how it works. And we are getting the benefit of their cutting edge developing technology in terms of predicting our energy management and our energy use. Autodesk is another. Uh, Autodesk is a very large company, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Uh, leader, in, in, leader in industry, CAD CAM design and 3D design. Uh, they had a project for an inter interactive building information model that they envisioned going from the architect stage all the way through to the, um, constru to the construction bid stage, to the construction implementation stage, to the as-built delivered to customer stage, to the operation by facility engineer stage with using the same model and the same software. Uh, and since our building was so new, we were able to collaborate with them uh, on that project. And Metric Systems is another local small business that's looking at plug load management, uh, and we've partnered with them. Uh, we received a number of awards. The most recent one was last year from the California uh, Green Technology Summit uh, Green Building Leadership Award. And that's really my signal to, to stop and take questions from the audience. I have some other slides about things that we do at Ames, but that's really kind of the top level of how the building operates. And I get really excited and enthusiastic about it, so I could just go on forever. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I know one of the buildings at Stanford, it was either engineering or environmental sciences, uh, took a similar goal. I wonder if you're familiar with that building and you can compare and contrast your... So there are a lot methods. of buildings at Stanford and increasingly buildings at Stanford that are trying to do this. You might be talking about um, Y2, E2, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm not familiar with it recently, but I know during the um, period of uh, like 2009, 10, 11, 12, we had a we had a group. What did we call it? Um, it was some uh, guiding group. It was a um, building information modeling workshop group. Uh, we actually had a number of companies and universities that were interested in the concept of building information modeling. Now, Autodesk turned out to be a Space Act agreement, an actual partnership that, uh, that um, we concluded as a result of this. But for a long time, we had a group of, uh, of folks, mostly from the US, I 
can't recall if there were any internationals, that uh, would meet in about quarterly, and we would discuss the general field of building information modeling <coughs> and the conduct and progress of sustainability base, and the Stanford folks were key members of that. And in fact, we had some of our later meetings of that uh, building information modeling BIM workshop at Stanford. And that was where I learned an um, uh, in, in, interesting tidbit that the, de the departments that were going to live in that building, I can't remember all of the names of them precisely, but they were design and architecture and sustainability and technology kinds of, and they were really excited, even though they had to move out temporarily of wherever they had been working so that it could be demolished and rebuilt as Y2E2. Uh, they were really exciting, excited to see the finished product because they too were planning on like 2,000 sensors so that they could really precisely control their heating and their lighting and their energy use. It would be a great teaching tool for students. Well, sometime when they were not in the building during the design and construction phase, uh, the university management and the construction management hit some financial problems and they needed to reduce some costs and some scope of the project. Uh, and so the um, the architects in the construction company you know, looked at the plan and they said, you know, 2,000 sensors, who needs that? That's kind of crazy, that's really expensive. Why don't we save some money there? And so the, as the story goes, like I say, I'm only getting it secondhand, but as the story goes, when they finally moved back into it, they didn't have nearly the access for either the information or the control points that they had anticipated. And I remember a number of meetings that we had in there where there were really you know, trivial problems about not being able to control this light or having the room be too hot and you couldn't adjust it and everything. And it was really frustrating because it was the same kind of problems that you would have in a building that was, you know, 10, 15, 20 years older that they truly anticipated they would never have to deal with again. So, uh, you know, another lesson of, and, and another, something similar to what we learned at, at, um, at Ames, if you can award a contract that is design, bid, build, that is the best way to do things because you can hold your build elements, your construction elements, to the design and tie the, the finances and the costs all the way along the life cycle. We didn't do that, so that's a lesson learned. We had a design, and then the bid build came following the design from different companies. Uh, NREL, I think, did it all together, design, bid, build, all together. And I don't know how Stanford did it, but you know, it's, it's one of those places where information gets lost between the design and the intent and the actual building and construction when changes get made outside of your control. Thank you for the presentation. So you are using a ground source heat pump. Do you have any data regarding the performance of that, how efficient uh, what's the average COP and that kind of stuff? So uh, I, I don't have that in slides, like a chart of what the efficiency is, but um, thank you for mentioning that. I, I know I passed through that slide. That's an example of one of the elements of the building that we're really, really happy with. Um, it also has you know, one of these interesting stories that it's, um, I think there's about, I think mean, there's more than half a kilometer of um, uh, two inch PVC uh, between the building and the ground, uh, the ground source field. Uh, we, we did surveying of the nearby field where we were going to install all of that piping for, for the ground source water. And, and I should point out that we're not using ground water. What we're doing is running lengths of pipe through the subsurface soil and using the constant temperature of the subsurface soil to condition the temperature of the water. Uh, using, again, these in situ principles. So then we bring the water into the building at a standard constant temperature that we can rely on, and then we heat it up marginally to run through radiators to warm the building, and we chill it marginally to run through ceiling panels that will cool the building. So the, um, the ground source system has, uh, I think it's 100, uh, we dug 100 holes, might be 200, they're, they're paired, so it goes up and down, and then it moves across and goes up and down. Uh, and I think that they're about 400 feet, but initially our plan was to have them deeper than that. And we had surveyed the area, and it looked like that would work. The first couple of holes that were drilled were fine, but pretty early, it was like the sixth hole or something, they hit a geyser. 
Um, so they had broken through a geological formation of, of schist, and they got to some free um, groundwater. And it wasn't our goal to harvest groundwater. And so they did a quick replanning for how they were going to deal with this field. And they increased the number of holes, but decreased the depth of the holes um, in order to get the, the whole length that they needed to condition the water. But it's been a very reliable system. It makes the building a very comfortable building. It's really quiet. You don't have the sound of forced air. You don't have dust and allergy problems, uh, which also um, makes it easier to generally keep, keep the building clean. Um, and it's just, it's very comfortable. I've also heard in the last couple of years under operation, the, 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 room, the, the building has the reputation of, of running cold. Uh, and I haven't heard anybody give a precise explanation of why it runs cold, but it does tend to be cooler rather than warmer more often than not, which is different than we had anticipated. The energy models actually indicated that with the passive cooling we were doing, there was no air conditioning. It's not entirely true. There's one room that has air conditioning because it's a conference room, and the passive cooling was rated not to be able to maintain that temperature when you had like 100 people in the room. So there is one room that has a dedicated air conditioner. The rest of the building is all passive. Uh, and it looked like um, if we had a run of days, like four or five days in a row with uh, 100 degrees temperature outside or more, that passive cooling wasn't going to be able to make the building comfortable. And our plan for that was just let people go home and work from home. But in fact, we've never encountered that. And as you know, we've had a number of occasions uh, where we've had a string of days of 100 degrees. Uh, and then more than one string. And, and we've never found that building to be uncomfortable. So that's really, really nice. But I can put you in touch with somebody who can find out that data if one. I just don't know it. Have you looked at the new Apple campus? They supposedly have a lot of innovations, in, especially in heating and cooling. I can see it from, from my um, backyard. But other than that, I haven't been over there. No, I, 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 don't know what, I don't know what they're doing for the, for the heating and cooling. Do, do you know what technologies they're using? I know they're using a lot of outside air for, because they say the climate here is perfect 75% of the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, and that's another reason why this kind of design, and we've shared this with our, um, we've shared this many times in, in public presentations, but especially with our federal partners. And the, the design plans and everything that we have is, is open and public. Um, because many of these things work so well that we wanted to encourage uh, other people who are you know, considering new construction to use some of these techniques. In this area, as you say, the outside air temperature is very permissive for, for doing a lot of um, in situ resource utilization, using the natural temperature outside instead of artificially cooling and heating your location. Use the fact that you work in a comfortable Mediterranean environment. We do that a lot in the building. Um, it's, um, we draw in fresh air overnight. There's a standard protocol. Uh, it provides uh, some cooling. The fresh, some of the fresh air is trapped in, um, there's like a plenum, like all of our floors are like, like the elevated stage here. Um, and they have, uh, it's not as high as this, it has, I think, a foot um, between the concrete, the poured concrete slab and the actual floor that you're walking on. And that traps um, cool air when cool air is brought in overnight. So that provides you a little bit of cooling from underneath as well as fresh air. Uh, and we also, as I said, we have manual windows and no longer automated windows, but manual windows. And it's a negative pressure building, so every time somebody opens a door or window, that sucks air in. So that's another way that we get more fresh air. Um, my question, thank you again. This was so informative. My question is, I know um, you had mentioned $27 million, but if we wanted to do that in our own home, like I know people have done this, but um, is there any way to make it even, like? For other people, for other companies and other uh, builders to follow the same thing, is there? Are you doing any studies on how to make it progressively cheaper? So we wouldn't typically do a study like that, mm -hmm. right? Because we're we're NASA. We do studies exactly. about aircraft exactly. and space exploration. Exactly. But um, I've been asked the question uh, a lot about how expensive it was, um, especially you know, five six years ago, to incorporate all of these technologies. And it, it's complicated to do that kind of economic assessment, uh, partly as we were talking about electricity. Since we buy our electricity from WAPA and we get a special rate for federal agencies which are, have combined all of their buying power, you know, I, 
I will probably misspeak, but the, uh, the price that we were paying the last time I looked a couple of years ago was about a third of what most places were paying for commercial rates and maybe a quarter of residential rates or something like that. So we were already getting a really good deal. So if the argument that we were making at the time to our NASA headquarters about why we should invest in solar panels or why we should invest in a solid oxide fuel cell, if you made it solely on an economic basis, you actually couldn't sell that because the power we were getting locally was so cheap. And you couldn't even entirely make it on a sustainability greenhouse gas basis because the WAPA power is predominantly hydroelectric. So it was really leaning on our role as a, a forward-leaning research and technology organization that was part of what made those choices appropriate. Although in the case of the solar panels, as I mentioned, we worked with PG&E and we got a good deal on how we were buying it. So, and with Bloom Energy, we're partnering with them. They, it was a NASA technology to begin with. So there were all these kinds of reasons of why we did it. We also looked at um, uh, the argument or the economic analysis of the, the money that we were initially given to build a 50,000 square foot building was uh, whatever uh, we, we proposed and, and NASA headquarters said that's a reasonable fair market rate for building a building of that scale at, in 2009. As I mentioned, the first design that was done was completely scrapped. I don't know actually offhand how much that cost. But I know that when it was done and presented and when we decided, and I'll give Steve Zornitzer a shout out again today because it was his retirement party, when Steve said, that's just not good enough, uh, headquarters said, good on you, but you're not getting a dollar more. So in fact, sustainability base and everything that went into it was done for less than headquarters initially gave us because they didn't top us back up again after we decided to go for a different design. So this building with all of its features was no more expensive than the 1980s building that the initial design called for, which would have been nowhere near as sexy as this. And frankly, I don't know where they would have spent that money or why, it was, why that building was that expensive. And maybe in some areas it, it's in uh, like remediation of some of the stuff that they were doing as construction practices. But if instead you do your construction carefully, um, targeting getting um, a lead platinum rating, uh, which we did, and some of the points that are associated with getting um, leadership in environmental and engineering design, is that, I always mm -hmm. get the acronym wrong, mm -hmm. from the US Green Building Council. So some of the points that you can earn towards lead uh, have to do with how you manage your, your site and where you get your materials. So if you do that carefully and if you source your materials locally, that may be some of how it was actually cheaper to, to and, do it that way. And I have one final question. Um, are you doing another iteration of the sustainability base, like a Martian base or something? Well, so the, the reason that sustainability base got that name uh, is that 2009 in July, when the contract for sustainability base construction was signed, was the anniversary of the establishment, the 40th anniversary of the establishment of Tranquility Base on the moon. And so our internal um, message tagline was, uh, NASA was responsible for the most advanced habitat off the planet in 1969. Humans lived in Tranquility Base. And so we wanted this to be the counterpart, the most advanced sustainable building on Earth as of 2009. And so we gave it the name Sustainability Base. In fact, when, when the renovation by replacement competition was held in, started probably 2007, 2008, the results were known. Uh, as you may realize, thinking on your presidential history, that was prior to uh, President Obama's term. And this facility was initially called the Collaborative Support Facility. Even though, shout out to Steve Zornitzer again, Steve had a really strong personal commitment and he wanted to make that a really strong NASA commitment to making a sustainable building. Um, he felt, I felt, this is one of the reasons why um, I got involved in this project and resonated so strongly with Steve. It's my feeling that NASA is uniquely the federal agency that um, is charged with thinking about exploring space and understanding whether we're alone and how life originated here and whether life may exist somewhere else. And whatever the answer is, if, if we are alone, then we have a unique responsibility to be stewards for this place if this is the only place that there is life. If we're not alone, then it would be good to uh, be um, proud of what we've done in this place should we ever meet any of those other 
life forms or be able to communicate with them, more likely communicate than meet. Anyway, um, so that makes NASA unique. And internationally on the planet, NASA is by far the best funded organization that does exploration. There are certainly others and we partner with them, but none of them come near the, f the funding that NASA gets. Uh, and also with our assets, airborne assets, satellite assets, we're looking at the planet and how our own planet is, is evolving and changing. So we understand this. You know, we gather the data and we have our own in-house scientists who are looking at the data. We know what's happening to the planet. Uh, and all of those things taken together along with our mission to develop technology really uniquely places us that when we have an opportunity to step out and do something that's right in our new construction, we need to do that. So, Steve and I always really resonated on that. So we always wanted to think of it as sustainability-based, and we always wanted sustainable design, forward-leaning design, living laboratory design to be front and center in that. But NASA headquarters was not of a mind with us. Uh, they're part of the executive branch, and the only way of proposing this to, to them was just to call it the Vanilla Collaborative Support Facility. The economics and the reason we won the competition was because we were tearing down the 14-foot subsonic wind, wind tunnel, and this is what we were going to build, and that's how we got it. For the first several years, even during the Obama administration, to headquarters, we had to call it the Collaborative Support Facility. Locally, we called it sustainability base. We weren't able to come out and take it out of the closet and call it sustainability base until the last four years, and now it's just the name has stuck. But um, honestly, as, um, as Gary mentioned about the Federal Sustainability Award, that's not being given anymore. And once again, the executive branch has very much changed attitudes about the need for sustainable design and the value of sustainable design. So typically, I think now when our facilities managers talk about this, this facility and other new ones that we want to build, they are again making the economic argument. They're making the argument about um, resource utilization uh, and um, energy stewardship. Uh, but it's not really about sustainability anymore. We have a new building that's under construction. It's not going to be LEED Platinum. I'm not sure that we have the, the funding any longer to pay for LEED certification. Uh, when you get into LEED, you have to pay for the certification and the review. But I, I understand it's being built to equivalent to LEED Gold standards, but I don't think that they're going to seek certification. We also last year got our um, new master plan approved by headquarters. We're required to update our master plan every five years, so it's a rolling plan. And uh, our last due date for, for creating an update was in 2017. Again, Steve was a leader of that, and I was one of the people on the team. We recognize that we have a number of geophysical vulnerabilities here because we're on the edge of San Francisco Bay. So we have climate change, we have sea level rise, we have stormwater management. We also have uh, seismic challenges. And uh, we're in really prime real estate for, for, um, for cost, for expense, for our location in Silicon Valley. But it also has significant challenges. Uh, and so it's our obligation as stewards of, um, of the work that's done at NASA as, as, um, as public servants, as civil servants, as federal employees, to consider what would happen if there was an earthquake? What would happen if we lose land as a result of sea level rise? We're not able then to maintain our mission. And if we can't provide you know, our expertise and keep our mission going, that's, that's, a, that's mission failure and that's something that federal agencies you know, don't want to countenance. So we're looking at that very, very carefully. We've done quite a number of studies and collaborated with a number of the, the agencies um, and the municipalities around the Bay with respect to sea level rise stormwater management, water recycling efforts. Um, and we also, of course, because we have a significant workforce, we, we're worried, like all of you, about traffic management and the cost of, cost of housing and good schools and, and all of those kinds of things. So we looked at all of that in our master plan. Uh, and generally speaking, because um, I'm not aware of, of any way of preventing the uh, estimations of sea level rise, we're generally moving away from the edge of the bay and consolidating our facilities further towards the 101 end, the um, western end, as it's, as it's possible to do so. We're also looking at buildings that are, um, at, that are taller, that have uh, less of a footprint, uh, more and more pedestrian-friendly uh, walkways, and um, in, in putting up these larger uh, buildings, we're looking at designs that have some of the similarities of, of openness that encourage collaboration and collaborative exchange, as you have in sustainability base. But we didn't even talk about the noise issue, and that's a whole other thing in a, in a big open facility.
So you kind of mentioned that it's not part of the mission to continue to evolve, but that doesn't going to stop anybody who's involved with the project from not thinking about that. So I'm curious what kinds of things, you know, if you were to do, you know, the next, the next step or the next generation, what kinds of things are the most interesting? I mean, you know, whole, you know, you have a lot of sensors, internet of things has really um, kind of really changed the face of that since the, um, since the time when this was built. So uh, I give maybe two answers to that. We have continued to use the facility as a living lab. And some of those partnerships that I mentioned with companies like Vertigree and Metric and stuff like that, new ones come up all the time. Uh, one that I don't even have a slide on was with a company called View. So there's a company called View, V-I-E-W, and they're located off of Highway 237, because I've been over to their place. They make um, electrodynamic windows. So they approached us, and they wanted to install their windows in our location and gather some data. Uh, turns out that the windows that we have, uh, which were um, state-of-the-art at the time, they're um, double-paned, argon-filled, um, glazed, so, so they, they, were, they were the most energy efficient windows that we could buy at that time. And it turns out that this company, View, uh, uses OEMs, yeah, you know, over, over, the, over market, remarkets, I guess. So they start with the same window, and then they apply an electrodynamic film. Uh, so uh, electrodynamic film darkens or lightens the windows, and so that can provide you with shade, it controls um, heat gain into the, into the um, interior of a building. Um, so it, it can make your, it can be more energy efficient and it can make it more comfortable for occupants. Well, we didn't have the funding to exchange out all of the windows. So even though we were kind of persuaded that the, the technology is actually a little bit better, it does use a little bit of electricity, but very, very little. Once you change the state of the window, it's a very low wattage to, to maintain that. So it's not very expensive in electricity and it had some really cool features, but we couldn't afford it. Uh, we, we thought about doing a Space Act Agreement partnership with them, but when you're moving windows in and out of a building uh, and you have to explain to the lawyers about why that's a partnership, because surely they, the lawyers feel you ought to own your own windows. How do you partner with an external entity on, on your windows? Seems like it's a fundamental element of your facility that you ought to be constantly in control of. So uh, instead of doing a Space Act Agreement partnership there, we were worked with VIEW and we were able to come up with a plan where in one particular office, which um, was one that our initial energy modeling showed, was it was in a corner of the building that was going to get a lot of sunlight. There just didn't happen to be very many trees and stuff. And the, the woman who was in that um, office was really uncomfortable. That office would get hot. There was, it was terrible with glare. Uh, you could put all the shades down, but then it was just dark, and so it definitely had a problem. So we thought, this is ideal for the view window. It would be great if we could replace her windows. And so view gave us a bid for changing out all the windows, uh, the materials and the labor, that was, I think, $9.99.99. And we had a, um, uh, a number of civil servants have um, credit cards for making small purchases that have a $1,000 limit. So we thought, okay. So we can buy the windows from you, and the contract said that our windows are going to go into storage at their location. If we ever want them back, we can get them back, and they'll do it for us. And their windows are coming into our location, and if they ever want them back, they can come and take them back and give us our windows. If we don't want their windows, we give them back. So you know, it was just good for everybody, and it came in under the price that we could do on a single credit card. So and then happened about four years ago, and the windows are still there. And the woman in that office loves it. You can darken the windows to its maximum extent, and when you're actually in the room, it doesn't feel dark at all. It just somehow feels more comfortable because you're limiting the heat that's being gained into the office. So that's one of the areas where we're constantly looking for new ways. Uh, another one was in, with a fiber optic device that you can either put on a roof or you can put out in a garden. You just want it in a place where it can get a lot of sunlight. And uh, apparently it, it has a very efficient and advanced collector of, of light. And then it efficiently transmits those photons through fiber optic tubes. And you can lead that natural light into some other interior places in the building. So we're always looking for new things like that that we can try and do and for creative ways of 
being able to appropriately, legally, financially accomplish it. Yeah, yeah and of course the data mining. Uh, the other main element of what we're doing in the building with all of these different systems and with uh, all the information we get from the sensors is using that to feed into our own software that's looking at data mining and prognostics. Um, prognostics is like predict to failure. When you, when you send something out, like a space vehicle or you build a habitat on another planet, uh, you, you want to be very, very, very cautious about failure. You have redundant systems, but you also want to know when something's going to fail. If there are no human beings involved, you still have an enormous investment, an enormous expense, a big science payload, a lot you can learn that you want to learn. So you're constantly monitoring, I mean, everything works on energy. You're constantly monitoring how all your devices are, are operating and particularly what your energy balance is. So if something goes wrong with your battery and you know eventually it's going to, you want to know that as soon as possible so you can then replan the remaining life of those scientific instruments so you get your most valuable readings while you still can. And, and optimize the return from that mission. And of course, if there are humans, as you can imagine, there'd be other you know, elements of how you need to you know, manage those kinds of systems. So that's something that's really fundamental to the work that we do at Ames and sustainability based by virtue of how um, the sensor networks are deployed and our partnerships with groups like Autodesk and Vertigree gives us a lot of consolidated information that we can then use to make our NASA systems for space exploration and aircraft and, and um, and space habitats more robust, more reliable. I think they want you to wait for the th microphone. I'm just curious for a building like this, is it easy or difficult to make changes or expand? Or expand? Expand it, yeah. Like our South Bay Airport is elite certified, but if we ever need expansion, um, is it? Does it get complicated? That's, that's a really good question. Uh, and my, my initial um, thought is that it's complicated, but I'm trying to, to tease apart in my mind what part of it is complicated inherently because of the building and what part of it is complicated just because it's a federal agency. Um, it, as far as, I think it's mostly complicated because it's a federal agency and there's a lack of funds, but no lack of, of oversight or bureaucracy. The building internally is inherently created and designed to be fully reconfigurable inside. Um, your question makes me remember that, but I'm now thinking, have we ever reconfigured it? Uh, only, I think, in the most minor ways. Uh, and there has been some modification done inside. Now, I haven't been over there recently, but I remember there, the hearing that there was going to be. So uh, the, the design allows for a lot of reconfiguration. The, the walls that are present are, they're very few. There are only a few walled off offices around the edges. And most of it, as you see, is the, um, just the waist height divisions and the way the floor is elevated off the concrete slab allows you to reroute telephone and computer wires and things like that and then you can just move around your internal furnishings and you only have a few walls that are around the edges and the walls are actually sort of walls uh, with air quotes because they don't go all the way up to the ceiling which is another issue for sound management but um, it was designed that way for um, the um, homogeneous exchange of the air for the heating and the cooling. Um, so it is a design feature that the walls don't partition certain places off from each other and you still get a circulation of the, of the air to maintain temperature. So there are design choices like that all around. The only um, expensive modification I recall being discussed was to do things like to, to subvert the underlying design of the building by creating some more private offices or um, adding you know, additional doors and things when another project wanted to move in there and the, the whole total open space didn't work for them. Um, and you know, honestly, I can't remember whether they, in the end they decided not to move in and not to spend or whether they did move in and do the modifications. But the discussion kind of answers your question. If we do, some modifications have been proposed uh, but they're mostly against the design concept that was the original design concept. The original design concept is very flexible.
but getting anything done in a federal building is pretty complicated. It sounds like uh, you don't have to follow the standard procedure to get approval from planning department, from the housing department, for all your changes, even it's touching the utilities and everything. Mm -hmm. You have the freedom. We, no, no, we do. Uh, we do. Uh, we, we always obey the local building codes. We interface with local municipalities. Uh, we have to think about um, the California well, CEQA requirements. We're, we're subject to California CEQA requirements. Uh, so we, we are subject to um, most, if not all, of those things. And I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not an expert on that. But I know that we, we pay a lot of attention to that, and new projects go through all of those checkboxes. For, for internal kinds of modifications, like the question about how hard would it be to modify the building, we also have a construction permit review board. Uh, and any time you want to um, install anything or make a modification to anything, uh, whether it's um, sometimes there are individual modifications that a principal investigator or a researcher will want to do in his or her laboratory for some reason, and you know where those impact the um, the infrastructure, they have to be proposed and advocated to the construction permit review board, which meets every week I think on Tuesdays. I've done I've taken things to them before, uh, but not in a while. So there are local uh, control processes for all of that, and we do interface with you know all of the external communities as well as the state. Uh, it's just that for the, the one that I mentioned that we didn't follow uh, was locally recycling our own water. At the time, that wasn't typically allowed. Maybe you could have gotten a waiver, but, but again, we, you, as I said, we didn't have to. We're federal property. But all of that was completely contained. So, you know, where it crosses boundaries and where water pipes and electronic and, and things like that cross off of our land onto someplace else, of course, we always have to comply with all of those requirements. I see. So you still need to get uh, all the permits yeah. to do those. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We have a lot of permitting, um, and not only for the buildings, but also for the, uh, the air quality, the Bay Area Air Quality Board. Um, I mentioned that we have oversight for the um, water remediation for the Superfund site. So there are a whole variety of, of requirements that we have for, for safety, Occupational health and safety, environment, energy, energy management, and uh, all the um, reporting requirements that California has for locations that produce certain amounts of greenhouse gases or operate certain diesel uh, generators or things like that. We have all of those same requirements. Also need to uh, fit the uh, uh, land use. Is that right? Uh, well, it's it's federal land, so it's not like zoned residential or zoned commercial. It's just federal property. Um, however, if we were to propose to do something there uh, that, that would be substantially different, then there would be local communities that would have interest in that who would communicate their interests in, in groups to their elected officials who would communicate their interests to our representatives in the state legis legislature and in the national, and they would communicate to the senators, and we would hear about it. Thank you. Yeah, you spoke about uh, data mining. Um, so uh, I presume you do some analysis on the collected data, and is that typically used to, uh, you know, modify characteristics to refine things on a constant basis? Let's say water utilization, gray water utilization, things of that sort. So, what what do you do with the collected data? At the moment, it's a research project. Okay. It, it's not, to my knowledge, uh, unless things have changed recently, it's not the kind of thing that we um, have enough experience and validity behind to be altering the, the approach that our facilities managers are taking. Uh, but it's a, it's a research project that one hopes would gradually generate sufficient data to be able to feed into the work that facility managers do, and even to be to be predictive, to learn year on year. If you have uh, data from you know multiple years about the change of the seasons and the change of the employee habits, and you know at certain times of the day, certain times of the year when you're using more or less energy, that you would be able then to become predictive 
and uh, condition the building so that uh, if, if under certain set of circumstances and it predicts the, the, the models uh, predict that those circumstances are going to happen tomorrow, the building gets a little hot, then you would want to actually pre-cool the building on that date so that you don't get the hot spike. So we would use the data to do that. We haven't achieved that yet, but you're, you're right. That's uh, the, kind of, uh, the kind of goal that we have. As in a small example of that, Vertigree Technologies um, has a device which is able to measure from a central circuit box the energy draw from all the downstream devices and to uh, deconstruct f the, the signals from all those individual devices based on its pattern of energy use. Uh, and we have one installed in, in, in one of our locations and, and we're partnering with them on the data. In another location, in a hotel, they had one of these devices installed in a, in a kitchen and it was uh, reporting that a bank of dishwashers, um, one of them was delivering back unusual readings, anomalous readings, wrong readings. So the, the dishwasher was still functioning and dishes were still coming out and they looked clean, but the dishwasher had changed in its profile of energy use. Mm -hmm. And so the Vertigree device reported this and the facility manager investigated it. And it turned out this, that the sterilization cycle on that dishwasher in a large hotel with restaurants and everything wasn't working properly. So that was an example where the installed box was able to uh, reveal and predict to the managers that uh, the dishwasher wasn't sterilizing properly. And you can imagine that you know, this could have um, prevented a whole run of you know, uh, unknown, why is everybody getting sick and testing everything and testing all the food and testing all the surfaces and everything comes back fine, but why is everybody getting sick? Well, it was a dishwasher. So they were able to prevent that from happening by using the information, by data mining, just the, the electrical energy signatures of the devices. That were, that were plugged in downstream of the circuit box. So that's some of the kind of thing that we're looking for the data mining. Thank you. We've maybe come to time, it's like eight o'clock. I, I mean, I'm happy to hang out for a little while and answer questions that you thought were too technical that other people might not be interested in. I'm, I'm happy to stay if you have any of those, but it's been a, a great pleasure. Thank you so much for giving me the time to stand up here like it's kind of like a daydream that I have of, you know, having a whole hour and a half to talk about nothing but the building. I love it. Thank you. Thank you very much.